of our TPE uh, series of this webinar is called the TP the finding the best fit while you're job searching. Please note that the webinar is recorded and it will be available on the TPE YouTube channel within the next week. Uh, during the presentation, if you do have any questions, uh, please go to uh, use the GoToWebinar question box and type up your question, and we'll be able to answer your questions at the end of the of the presentation. I would like to take this time to present our presenters. Uh, myself, I'm serving as one of the facilitators in for Guerra and. And I'm the director for the Office of Equity and Inclusion and at Whittier College. Hi, good morning and afternoon, everyone. My name is Annalisa Hernandez Garcia. I'm one of the presenters um, this morning and afternoon. Currently, an assistant director of student leadership and development at California State University, San Bernardino. And just to provide you all with some background information, I am a graduate of University of Central Missouri. So um, I've been working in this profession for about five years, and I've worked at three different institutions. Um, also, just to let you all know, unfortunately, my formal colleague, Marina Lazaro, will not be able to present today. But however, if you do have any questions or concerns, at the end of the presentation, our contact is available. And Great. So just to get us started, um, I'm really hoping that by you all attending this lovely webinar, we're hoping that um, you all will be able to analyze different position descriptions. Um, hopefully we'll be able to evaluate and provide you all with strategies when it comes to salary expectations and negotiations, identify strategies for an institutional fit. And so as we move forward, uh, you all with exactly analyze position descriptions, how to accurately review job titles, how to research salary, and discover the institutional fit that's best for you. So um, to kind of um, jump um, webinar, um, when it comes to position descriptions, or also known as PDs, it is very, very important that um, that this is something that you all pay close attention and that it is reviewed closely. Um, what is a position description exactly? It's a group of It is a structured document that is supposed to let you know what's going to be expected of you after orientation and training. It is supposed to um, completely describe the permanent duties and responsibilities that are assigned description, um, but also it's very, very important that a position description should also assist, explain the classification of the position, identify the training that it's necessary to perform the position, and provide any type of development to needs, recruitment, organization, planning, and also to the that will help establish the potentially be given in your role, as well as the position standards. So throughout my experience in higher education, and the broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Um, so sorry about that. <laughs> so when it comes to position descriptions, there are many positive and negative factors to just really be on the lookout for. Um, just some things to note when it comes to a positive or very strong position that's written really well, it should describe the overall skills and the competencies that are needed to perform that role, and it should define where that position fits within the overall department or office hierarchy, or, or sorry, hierarchy and is used as a basis for an employment contract. So when it comes to position descriptions that are very well written, it should, it should have set expectations, it should legal basis, but also, too, you should really be able to understand what's going to be expected of you. Um, I have seen some position descriptions in the past that wasn't as greatly or well written, and so 
note or kind of be on the lookout is that when it comes to position descriptions, um, sometimes they can be very outdated, um, especially if it's an office or department that's very fast paced or the work is ever changing. If it's not as clear, that could mean or a clear indicator that there's just too much flexibility or just too many in the category of as other duties assigned. Um, and then also too, something to be on the lookout is just from an experience that I've had in the um, past um, was that there was a really well written position description that highlighted all the exciting things that were going to happen in that department. Um, I do have a residential education background and in that position description I mentioned that there's going to be new housing, there's going to be a lot of opportunities to supervise professional staff members, but what I didn't realize then was all that was going to happen in the next like three or four years and not necessarily in the next academic year. So those are just some things to look um, for position descriptions, some positive indicators as well as not so great indicators. Um, other things to take note when it comes to position description, um, one of the first things to pay close attention is the timeline of when that position was posted. Um, it's really important to note whether or not that timeline is a couple of days, if it's several weeks, or possibly several months. Um, something to note just from my experience that if it is something that's only posted within a couple of days, um, that department or office is just really trying to meet the HR requirements and there might be potential internal candidates or someone serving as an intern. Um, if it is open for quite a couple of weeks, um, it could mean that yes, they are searching nationally or it could be a very fast process. And if it's something that's more of a month or more, it may be that that department or area is really trying to focus on that national search. Um, when it comes to postings, also be on the lookout. Is that posting posted everywhere? Is it on the NASPA Facebook group pages? Is it on higher ed jobs? Is it possibly on LinkedIn? Or is it only specifically on the HR website and that's it? And that could also provide that indicator on whether or not that position, if they're really trying to go for that national search, or if there's some potential candidates in mind or an interim already serving in that role. Um, the next thing to also be on the lookout is the classification. And there's a lot of information about exempt and non-exempt um, out there and also some processes or changes that are happening. But really, it's going to be very important to know the difference between the two. Um, an exempt, if you find a position that's in that category, it's most likely going to be no overtime pay and it's going to focus more on salary basis. So um, let's say if you do have a, an employment and you are working 40 hours a week but sometimes you're working after hours but you're exempt you're not going to get compensated for working those after hours whereas non-exempt you are entitled to overtime pay but more than likely that fits under categories for employees that are more hourly also, too, you just want to be aware of the language that is being used depending um, on the university that you're at or if you're in a specific system. So currently right now I work in the CSU system. There are different classifications that are used um, within position descriptions and titles, which we'll talk a little more about later on in this webinar. And then last but not least is the overall position descriptions is that you're going to want to make sure that you're finding the information that you need to be successful in your search. Um, and to make sure that it highlights the responsibilities, the potential salary, if it's a live on, live off, and minimum versus preferred requirements. And something to note is that sometimes as you all are viewing position descriptions, it might say the average between like 40,000 through 75,000, like have a very, very large range. Um, something to note is some re sometimes the reasons why they have such a high range is to really um, try to market it to all whether folks have bachelor's, master's, or potential doctorates. Um, but it's also to, with doing your salary research, you'll be able to kind of know what is most likely going to be the pay rate, which we'll talk a little more in depth later on in the webinar. But then also to something to note when it comes to the 
and minimum and preferred requirements is in order to be eligible, you have to at least meet the minimum requirements. And if you meet the minimum requirements, I'd highly encourage you to apply, but also to note if there, if that position has a lot of individuals that are applying for that position, like in the hundreds, they're more likely going to seek out those positions, those individuals that not just meet the minimums, but also have the preferred requirements. So that just varies depending on how many individuals apply for that position. Um, so next, I kind of wanted to transition and talk a little bit about position titles or job titles. So I know out there in higher education, you'll come across so many different titles from coordinator, assistant director, executive assistant, specialist, and the list goes on. And so there's these two quotes that I really wanted to highlight as we discuss job titles. And the first quote was that titles mean everything to the classifications of our jobs and how we move within the workforce. But at the same time, these titles mean nothing. Um, and then the second quote is, I would encourage student affairs professionals to think of your position, not as a title, not as a trap, but as an opportunity to reframe your aspirations and align them in practice. And that's something that's really, really important that as you all are navigating your job search process and looking at titles. I know some may sound fancier than others. For example, like an assistant director sounds pretty fancy compared to a specialist. But in reality, depending on the university or the college that you work at, that's probably going to end up being the same same classification. So that's something to note is just because if a title sounds fancy or not as fancy does not necessarily mean one is better than the other. But in reality, you know, I would really like you all to focus on, you know, regardless of what the title is, it's really up to you as an individual of what you do within your role and, pos and position that will get you to that next level. Um, so when it comes to job titles or kind of trying to figure out the difference between a coordinator, assistance director, and so on and so forth, it's going to be very important that you all do your research through that human resources office for that um, university or college that you are trying to seek out. Um, most human resources websites within um, different universities will actually have the information of all the different administration and staff and faculty titles that are offered at that university. And most most of them will even provide an index, which is a list of administration and staff classifications by titles with job codes, summaries, position descriptions, and even pay plans. So within that index, you'll be able to get a better understanding why a specific position might be a coordinator or why a specific position might be classified as an assistant director or a specialist so on and so forth. And so a really great example, um, and I know later on this presentation will be given access to, is the University of South Florida. Their human resources breaks down their index very, very specific so that everyone has an understanding of why specific positions are titled certain ways and how they're classified. Um, also, what's really important as you all are navigating through your search, if you're coming across human resources, and if that information is simply not um, provided on their main website, feel free to call them directly and to get that information um, because that's not information that's necessarily, you know, hidden or private. That is information that can be shared to folks. Um, and then the next thing I kind of wanted to focus on, so some of this inspiration um, between, between the slides was actually from an article that I was able to find from the Student Affairs Collective that was called, Is It a Job Title or a Job Trap? Um, I would encourage you all to read through this article um, because it served a lot of great inspiration behind job titles. I will be completely honest, when I was first navigating my job search, I focused too much on the job title. And I thought the fancier the job title sounded, the better it was and that's not necessarily the case for um, all individuals so one of the first things when it comes to job titles and on the slide I know I mentioned dream big um, it's extremely important to note that there might be pe people that have similar titles so for example currently right now I am an assistant director and I have a colleague that's an assistant director but I actually do not supervise professional staff members while they do so something that I 
I've realized along the way is that once I realized that, hey, I wanted more experience in supervising professionals, but I'm currently not, I actually went to my supervisor um, and I oversee a lot of large scale projects and initiatives for the department, like student staff training and student leader selection. And now for every project or initiative I oversee, I actually have a professional staff member assigned to me. So that's just something to note that, yes, if you're in a certain um, position title, such as an assistant director or whatnot, and if there's things or components that are missing, don't be afraid to dream big and to reach out so you can still get those experiences that you're looking for. The next thing I kind of wanted to focus on a little bit was kind of redesigning your job description. Um, an example of this is that when I worked for my first professional position, I only looked at the position description three times. <laughs> the first time that I looked at the position description was when I actually applied for the job. The second time was when I signed my official hiring paperwork. And then the third time was when I was updating my resume. And that was it. And I realized through time as I started navigating this profession that I need to use my position description as a way for me to create that platform when I'm making decisions to projects or initiatives um, that I volunteer. I also compare my position description on a regular basis to other um, assistant directors that may be in similar my role or in future positions so that I'm constantly aware of what are the things that I need to focus on to get to my next level. And that's something that I would encourage you all to do that the moment that you have your position description or if you're currently in a role, to keep that with you always and to not just view it once or twice or three times like I used to previously. Um, and then last but not least, I wanted to highlight a little bit about how to be effective in what you're doing within your job title and knowing that the decision that you make for your current position should really set you up for your future employment and all the students, you know, in between. It's extremely important that every decision that you make should not just necessarily be like, oh, I'm going to commit to this so that I can be busy, but whether, but rather how it's going to develop you as an individual for your next role. So just, you know, taking note that yes, you know, when it comes to job titles, it could be very important to have those fancy titles if you would like. But at the end of the day, like I mentioned before, it's really what you do within the position that you're given. Okay, now I'm going to spend some time in discussing about salary. Um, so this is um, something that I'm very excited to mention. Um, and this is something that when considering, considering your employment, your next job search, this is something that's really, really important that just as much as you're researching that institution and the position and the department and so on and so forth, you should also be researching the salary as well. And one of the first things um, that I would recommend is when you're trying to research research the potential salary is to really research the cost of living. And so on the power or in the presentation slide, there are a couple of resources that I listed that I was not as I've been navigating my way through the field is um, there's this really good um, link called cost of living comparison from the um, smartasset.com mortgage, which it can actually compare where you're currently living at and where you're wanting to be and how much of a cost of living comparison you will need. Um, some other really great tools as well as bank rate, um, they actually will break down specific items like housing, doctor visits, and dry cleaning, kind of those everyday values or things that you may need within living that in that city or area. Um, many CNN, it breaks out relative cost by specific categories. So let's say if you have a family, if you're single, if you enjoy going out, if you um, if you decide to participate in community events, it really breaks down everything by categories and the interests that you're wanting to pursue. Um, the customer price index, um, which is really, I, I absolutely, I actually love all these tools, but one of my favorites is the customer price index because it compares the cost of living between any time periods between five major cities and like four regions. So as you all are navigating through your job search process, and especially if there's multiple 
places that you're looking at, you can actually compare the price of living. Like let's say if you're looking in California or Missouri, New York City, Florida, whatnot, and you can compare on what those averages should be. Um, because that's something to be mindful of. Let's say if you are um, job searching or searching for in California and, and you see the value of the position being like, oh wow, they're paying a lot. And whereas in the Midwest, if they're paying like 15,000 less, it could be because of the cost of living because living in the Midwest is probably a lot less expensive than it is living in California. And then last but not least, one of the last resources I wanted to share with you all is um, the U.S. Department of State also a variety of resources to help you all determine the best place for you to live. So let's say if you all have specific needs or wants or desires, if you desire that social life aspect, or let's say you want one that's really community driven and focused on um, on really entrepreneur shops or whatnot, you can actually take a survey and it will kind of estimate and show you kind of based on the needs that you're desiring, what locations would be best for you. Um, so and then also, um, I know we t discussed a little bit about um, searching for that area that you're wanting. The next step, once you're done concluding that and when researching about salary, it's going to be very, very important that you research the position and the institution. And so, um, and kind of viewing what salary ranges are within those different positions that you're interested in. So for example, if you are pursuing a state employment, a lot of different states, they have a policy center that's available for all public employee compensation data that is available for anyone to view. And so an example, since I am currently in California, um, California has a public employee compensation database. And by clicking on this uh, California Policy Center link, you can actually actually map out and view all the different universities that are state um, in this California State University system as well as the UC system to see what positions are currently or sorry what individuals are currently getting paid um, for any of those public entities and this is actually um, something that most states will actually provide is just a matter of researching and if you are having difficulty in trying to find this document for a state that you're interested in you can always reach out to me because I absolutely love to research um, and something to also note too um, from a private perspective is that most private universities will post their salary ranges within their position descriptions and a lot of times they're they're actually much more accurate than at times maybe as a state position would be and so so if you're wanting to know specifically what are the salary ranges for that position description or that classification for that private university, it would be best to contact human resources or HR directly to find that information out. Um, also too, let's say if you are navigating through your search and you're just like, wow, like nothing is working and I cannot find this information anywhere. Um, higher ed jobs, they do have a salary database in which um, the website links there, it's from higheredjobs.com backslash salary. And you can actually view a lot of the different universities and positions and what their current salary is. Um, something to note is that they are, it is something that I think is um, somewhat ever-changing, so it may not be as accurate always, but it serves as that really great foundation get an idea regarding about salary ranges. And then last but not least, um, there's this other one called Glassdoor, and um, you can also look for different positions within universities, but it's also really great too because you can actually look at other positions as well, like let's say if you're ever interested in working for like Starbucks or Disney or Target or whatever it might mean for those means in that area that you're looking at, you can actually compare the average salary rate for individuals at that um, city or location that you're looking into. Okay, so when it comes to um, salary and negotiations, I have a lot of tips when it comes to this information, but something that I just wanted to start off and share with you all is that when I first entered the field as a new professional about five years ago, I was actually given three job offers, and I ended up accepting the third one, which was my top choice, but I did not negotiate 
anything. And I ended up just accepting it right away because I was just so thankful and appreciated to have gotten that offer. Um, and also too, I am a first generation professional. So there was also that pressure that I needed to support myself and my family. Um, and so my advice is that moving forward when it comes to salary tips and like negotiation is that you all like I would really want you all to just really focus on like your worth and the value that you can bring to an organization, especially if you have multiple job offers. And when it comes to negotiations, especially as a new professional, it can be difficult to maneuver, but through time and experience, it will come easier. And so just during my time in the field, um, I know I, on the presentation screen, I have several different tips. So I just wanted to spend some time in going a little depth um, of what I mean by those things. So for one, when, it, when I mentioned the, con or sorry, conduct salary research, um, find your position title and institutional type and know what to expect and just research the cost of living. Those links and those resources that I shared in the previous slide will really provide that foundation. And it's very important that you have done your research. Um, the second thing when it comes to determining your walk away number, it's really important for you all to know what are you willing to accept regardless and what is the lowest salary that you're not willing to um, negotiate and just know when it is okay to walk away and stick with it. Um, the next thing to kind of focus is anchor up and not down and this is just something to know, know that just because you have a walk away number doesn't mean ask for that number specifically. Um, when I negotiated for the current position that I'm in, I went above my walk away number and I was able to receive more. So that's just something to note that yes, if you have a certain number in mind that's your lowest, that yes, like I will accept this type of amount. When you are negotiating, just don't go for that amount. Um, always try to negotiate a bit higher. And my recommendation would be is to try to at least add 2%. Um, to the offer that you're trying to counter. And the reason why is because for most positions out there, not necessarily all, but for most, you will most likely get a 2% raise like after the first year, depending if you're unionized or not. Um, and also too, sometimes contracts are renegotiated year by year, depending on the position that you're in. Um, also too, my next tip is that when it comes to um, negotiation, use exact numbers. Don't necessarily state numbers between like, let's say whole numbers like 45,000 through 55,000, but rather be specific. Like instead of saying 47,000, use $47,750. Um, the reason why is just through a lot of research that I've done and even these tips are highlighted from an article that I retrieved from higher ed jobs called eight tips for negotiating your salary is because the final offer will be close to what you're looking for and it shows that you've done your research if, you, if you're very specific with your numbers. So that's something I would really encourage you all to do. Um, also, too, when it comes to um, knowing your salary negotiation, come armed with your data and show your qualitative evidence that you, that you are worth that investment um, and not just necessarily comparing yourself to everyone in the profession. So um, for example, if you do experience on-campus visits or whatnot, don't be afraid to show and them information and your work of like previous projects that you've done, initiatives, things that you've managed, um, because it's going to be really important that they're able to physically see your value and what you can potentially bring to that office or department. Um, the next thing that I would go ahead and recommend is being aware of like knowing when to ask um, because timing is very, very important. And let's say if you are in a position where you could potentially negotiate your salary like year by year, don't necessarily wait until the end of the fiscal year to try to negotiate because a lot of times um, budgets or um, different uh, budgetary needs are determined a lot before the end of the academic year. So just being aware of your time period and being being aware of like when to ask is going to be very, very important. And then the last and not least other tip that I would mention is to kind of not be in a shame, but rather be confident. As I mentioned earlier on, when I was first navigating this field, I was not as confident and 
I just showed um, values, values of appreciation, but through time, I have realized that a lot of employers should be anticipating a salary negotiation, especially with new hires, and don't feel as if negotiating will start you off on the wrong foot, but rather it could really show that confidence level that you have and what you can really bring to that department or office. Um, but at the same time, you know, showing appreciation for an office for an offer and that confidence in your ability to earn a, a higher salary will definitely go a long way. Um, so when it comes about for institutional fit or also known as like the best fit, um, a model that I just really wanted to highlight is that when you're trying to find a really great fit for you as a professional, there's three different factors that I would really encourage you all to really take into account. Um, the first one being person to job um, fit really shows you as an individual of how well you feel like you would be able to complete that job responsibilities and what knowledge and skills and abilities that you have to perform it. The next factor would be person to group would be kind of what interpersonal skills or attributes would you have to be able to contribute to that team or how will you fit in in that team in general. And then the last one would be person to organization. Um, this is kind of in the end, like what are your values? What is your mission? And does the department or office and university that you're wanting to work for, does it align with everything that you're wanting in your next role or position? So in order to figure out what best uh, person to job or what person to group or person to organization fit would be best, um, there is this article that I wanted to highlight that was actually posted through the placement exchange. Um, and it, the title is Finding the Right Fit. And it, what I really liked about this article after that when you're when you all are trying to find these different key indicators there are specific questions that you have to ask yourself so for example the person to job fit like what is the best and worst worst job that you've ever held why was it what were the elements that made it the best or worst job you know taking time to really evaluate and to outline these things when you do try finding your institutional fit will give you a clear idea on what type of job you need to make you be at your best. Um, there's also some sample questions for person and group about thinking your perfect coworker, what qualities they possess, um, think of a team that you didn't work well with and why, and so that when you are, you know, kind of looking for those fit, you need to really also pay attention to the group dynamic in knowing that is it a group that you could potentially see yourself working with. And then last but not least, the personal organization fit. It's really just you evaluating and thinking about like what is your number one value? What would um, what would you be working at an institution that maybe didn't support your value? Would you or would you not? And, you know, and kind of thinking of those factors and barriers, because if you can go in and move forward with the job search, but I have a clear indicator on what you need from the position, what you need from your peer colleagues, and what you need from your organization, you'll know when, if you all are going through your on-campus visits and asking specific questions, you'll have a better idea what you need to look for. Um, my apologies. <laughs> Um, the next thing I also wanted to highlight, I know because of time, I'm not going to be able to show this video, but when I was actually going through um, my second job search, um, there was this essay speak that was held by Christina that was about finding the right fit and taking a risk that they hosted in NASA 2015 annual conference. And I would highly encourage you all to watch this essay speaks. Um, and the reason why is because this individual really spoke about, you know, what it takes to really finding the right fit and not being afraid to take risks. Um, I have been in the past in a position where I was too scared to leave for, you know, kind of all sorts of different reasons, but I realized that sometimes by taking risks, like you could even find even a better fit for you. And that's just something to note. And I would just encourage you all to check out that essay speaks, finding the right fit and taking a risk, because if you are kind of going through that slump or that confusion, or you just need some motivation about this topic, I'm hoping it will definitely encourage you all because it definitely encouraged me as I was going through a previous search. 
Um, so on the next slide, when it comes to institutional fit, um, there are some self-reflection questions that I would encourage you all to kind of answer and take some time to evaluate. I think it's very important that in order to determine if an institutional is a best fit for you, there are specific questions that you need to ask yourself. And I know some examples that I listed here are, are like currently, what are your interests? What are you have what expectations do you have of your first job your supervisor co-workers um, what are you willing to negotiate or potentially not negotiate by you all taking the time to really reflect on some of these questions will really provide you with that opportunity of what you really need from an institution and not just necessarily a job just to help pay for finances or bills or what um so um, after once you all kind of focus on your self-reflection questions, the next thing that I would encourage you all to do is to really um, evaluate some of the job quality questions that you really, really need. And so I listed some examples up here mentioning like, you know, what type of hours would you like to have? What institutional side is appealing? Um, who would you like your direct supervisor to be? How many individuals would you like to directly supervise? You know, thinking of these questions in advance will allow you to really get that clarity on whether or not a department or university will be best fit for you. Um, so also, um, some other things to note as well, after once you kind of um, participate in some of those reflective questions, I would strongly encourage you all to do your research. And what's really great is that there's a website um, from Pearson that actually share the demographics of each university or college. Um, it'll highlight its student population, the most popular student organizations, um, the cost of tuition, the most popular majors, and it just really highlights the demographics of that university. Um, and that's the website I'd strongly encourage you all to look into is petersons.com. The next thing, especially for those that are interested in pursuing residential education or housing, is that there is a 2017 Live In and Live On report. Um, and in that report, it kind of talks about the average and salaries within the positions that you're interested in, if whether or not you're allowed to have pets, the residents' populations, and etc. But something to note is that sometimes in this document, it may not be as accurate um, all the time, but it's just a matter of hopefully to be able to provide you with at least that foundation as you continue that search. Um, the next thing to look into is LinkedIn profiles. Um, I will be honest, if you all were to look at mine, it's not as up to date, but it will be soon. But that's also something to note is that now a lot of individuals are really looking into those LinkedIn profiles and looking at their potential supervisor, the things that they're involved in, maybe within their future colleagues, what are the things that they're doing within their positions or special projects. And um, that's something that if you do not have a LinkedIn or if you're trying to revamp your LinkedIn, that's something I would really encourage you all to do. Um, also too, when it comes to social media or, or websites, <clears throat> sorry, um, especially when it comes to um, departments and offices or your research, I would strongly encourage you all to look for those specific departments or universities, offices, social media pages. Um, I just use hashtag CSUSB because that's my current institution, but a lot of times you can find information about what are the universities currently promoting, what hashtags are they using, what programs are they hosting or facilitating, as well as student government. Um, what are the things that students are bringing up or the issues or the programs that they're hosting? And then last but not least, for student newspaper, I think could be extremely powerful especially when trying to determine what that university's climate is when it comes to being student-centered and student support. Um, most times you could even find that information by looking at the current student newspaper for that university. Um, also too, focusing on networks and connections and knowing that if you are potentially interested for working at a specific university is not being afraid to reach out to your connections and networks to see if they know anyone that currently works there or if you know someone that previously have worked there I think is very important and very valuable. 
And then also to knowing for an institutional fit, if it's really important. Um, and I know for me, something that I look at is to see how involved is that university and office and department on a regional, state, and national organization. For those people that are in those positions or involvement, what kind of things are they involved with? What kind of positions are they holding? What kind of national organizations are they affiliated with? Um, can also say a lot too when it comes to that professional and personal development of the employees for that department and university. Um, last but not least, when it comes to institutional fit, um, and I'm a huge advocate that when it comes to interview questions, um, just as much as interviewers are interviewing you all, you all are just interviewing just them as much. And one of the first advice that I would give is that when you're trying to think of specific interview questions, to really stay away from those generic questions that you know eventually you'll get the answers to. Like for example, um, like salaries and timelines and processes, but really allow that to take the time for you to ask those questions to really determine whether or not you will be a great fit for that position. And so one of the first things that I like to do is that I will actually brainstorm. What are the things that I value? What are the things that I need? What are the things that I want? And I will actually write specific questions to those things that I have listed. And so some examples um, for me, I am in, I'm a natural includer I'm really um, I really enjoy working in environments that are very people driven and focused hence the career that we're all in and so some examples that of questions that I've used in the past that I've liked to ask is really I've liked to I've gotten some really great responses on what really brought people there to that department and what keeps them there. Um, I also like to know like what are the things that they're passionate about and how they've incorporated that in their current position and what are they currently involved or affiliated with. Um, I think asking some questions that revolve around that, you'll be able to get to know your potential supervisor, your colleagues, or even campus partners a little bit more, and to kind of see like with the things and the responses that they say, does it align with what you value, what you need, and what you want? Um, so just kind of some of my final words um, about this topic and discussion is some of the advice that I would like to give you all is um, do not necessarily go for, um, for a position at a university or a college because you want to work for a specific person. Um, the sad reality is that unfortunately, um, people may not stay there forever, and I've actually had that happen twice to me, um, but I think that's also important to note is that, you know, when deciding for a position for you, you should be going for the experience and the development that you can gain, and not just just because a title or it may sound nice on paper. Um, also too, when um, you're trying to find that fit and um, potentially participate in on-campus interviews, you know, be sure that you're given the opportunity to speak to students, to campus partners. I know in the past I like to attend campus visits a day before so that I'm able to attend a university event or venture out in the community and to really see if it's going to be a good fit for me if I were to be offered. Um, also too, um, just note that it is is about what you do and the choices that you make that will really transform your experience um, in that position. Um, also too, I would also encourage you all to not settle for a position or to not just to not just stay in a position or to get stuck in a role and to not be afraid to take risks and to venture out to see what opportunities are out there. Um, also, too, um, remember when you all are applying for positions, even if you don't meet 100% of the qualifications, but you have really great transferable skills, don't be afraid to apply. When I first started as a new professional, I was only applying to positions where I felt like I met 100% of the qualifications. And I realized through time that that's not necessarily it, that I may have the transferable skills, and with the help of training, I could eventually get to that 100%. So I would say as long as you all are meeting a certain amount of percentage and you feel like you have those transferable skills, don't be afraid to apply. And then um, last but not least, um, I would really encourage you all to reach out to myself. And I know Maria, unfortunately, was not here on this webinar, but don't be afraid to reach out to us if you ever have questions about um, reviewing position descriptions or titles or if you need help with research or anything of that, um, we'd be more than willing to help you 
you all with any of those uh, questions or concerns that you may have. Hi everyone, um, my name is um, Jenny Guerra and I do want to apologize for the beginning of our presentation. I believe that there was no sound. So I do want to reintroduce, um, like I've mentioned, my name is Jenny Guerra. I'm the Director of the Office of Equity and Inclusion at Reader College and I serve as the Chair for the Candidate Development Team. And I'll let Anna introduce herself as well. Good afternoon, um, everyone. My name is Annalisa Hernandez Garcia, and I'm the Assistant Director of Student Leadership and Development at California State University, San Bernardino. Thank you. So, do please do know that this presentation has been is being recorded, and uh, it will be uploaded on a, T a TPE YouTube channel within a week. And if currently, if you do have any questions, uh, please use your webinar go to box to uh, to write down any questions. And um, I will start out with the first question. The first question is, how will you specifically phrase a negotiation? What will you say when you're asking for more? Oh, okay, great. So when it comes to like negotiations or trying to ask for more, um, that's when doing your research really, really helps. And that's something that I would encourage you all to do as you're researching. You have to be aware of the numbers. You have to know what people in similar roles at that university are currently making. Um, because another thing to note, like I know for me when I was going through my negotiation, um, there's people in the current role that I serve in that was at the university of a lot longer and not making as much. So that's just something to be aware of, that it's really, really important to know those numbers. But at the same time, if negotiations go back a couple times. When I made my last negotiation, we actually went back and forth th three times. <laughs> and so um, that's just something to note that, you know, at the end, you have to be aware of your numbers. You have to be confident and you have to know your worth and value. And if you are potentially struggling with trying to figure out, well, how do I negotiate? Or if you're potentially going to be offered something, you're more than welcome to reach out to me um, by phone or email. And I can definitely help you along the way because it is also unique too, depending on the position level that you're applying for, whether it is a, um, an entry level, mid-level, or even upper management level. I also wanted to add that we are we will be offering a negotiation uh, webinar on uh, next spring semester, um, so we will we'll go in depth of what that looks like. And also, when you're getting an offer, um, you do not need to accept the offer right away. Um, obviously, you want to say thank you so much for this offer, and um, by when do I need to let you know? Um, usually, they'll be able to give you from two to three days, and that's a good time for you to be able to do your research on like what is the number that they offer you, and be able to compare how Anna mentioned about doing the research about what is the other school's offers, and then you'll be able to compile and prepare yourself on how to have a conversation with the hiring manager. Next question, um, I have struggled with deciding whether or not to apply for a position at my undergraduate alma mater. What tips do you have to help to complete unbiased position and professional oh. cultural while avoiding being influenced by an overly positive or negative student experience? Oh, great. Um, that's an excellent question. Um, I can talk a lot about that because that um, I've currently um, went through that. I did my undergraduate degree at California State uh, University, San Bernardino, and I'm currently working there um, um, after venturing off for other positions. And so something that's really, really important is that if you are interested in going, you know, towards your undergraduate degree, and if there's individuals there that you know, or being that internal candidate, the biggest hurdle that you might be able, you're going to probably have to overcome is not necessarily being seen as that student leader, but as that professional. Um, and so with that, that kind of goes through your experiences and what you can, you know, um, and also too, you know, it could really be positive, you know, for you and the outlook, especially if you left as a student leader being very, very strong, or sometimes it could potentially hurt you in the fact of, let's say, if you weren't as strong as you were as a student, but you're very strong now as a professional. Um, and so that is definitely a lot of, um, 
it's a lot of mixture, I would say, when answering that question. But like I mentioned before, um, I would not mind I'm speaking to you directly, whether through email or over the phone, to talk a little bit about that because um, I have experience in doing that exactly. Next question. How long should I remain in my first position before applying for a position I feel is a better fit? Oh, um, I just want to make sure I understood the question correctly. So how long was I, was I in a position until I received benefits? No, uh, let me repeat it one more time. How long should I remain in my first position uh, before applying for a position I feel is a better fit? Oh, okay, that's an excellent question. And to be completely honest with you, it really depends on who you ask in this field. Um, when I first entered this field, I thought that you had to be in a position between two to three years before even considering leaving. And um, during my time, I have worked at three different institutions. Um, the first institution, I was there for about two years, but the second institution that I was at, I was actually only there for nine months. That was not intentionally I actually thought I was going to be there a lot longer but it was because another opportunity came my way um, that I didn't even expect at the time and I went for it so that's just something to note is that when it comes to navigating the job search don't necessarily think that you have to be in a role for a specific amount of years but to always be ready for different opportunities that comes your way. And so that's also something too that I would also recommend if you're currently in a position and if you are not as happy or you're try it wasn't maybe the best fit for you, don't necessarily stay in a position or a role because you feel like you have to. Because one, it's not, you know, it's you're not necessarily taking care that you need, but also too, you might be hurting the department as well. And you, um, you know, always want to make sure that you're thinking what's best for you and also what's best for the department. Next question. Uh, what things do you recommend looking for that seek to fit for an on-campus interview? Oh, so what are things that I look for on an on-campus interview? Yes. Um, so some of the things that I really, really look for, and for me, it's really about the fit and what I value. So for example, through my time, um, I, I do identify as being a first um, generation um, student and professional. And that was something that I was really, really looking for in my search of being able to give back to um, to a community that had similar identities to myself. So now I do work at a Hispanic serving institution that over 80% of our student population is first generation. Um, so I know when it comes to like on campus visits, it's really going to vary on like what you value most and what you need, but then also to not being afraid to ask those questions so that you get a better understanding of what that institutional climate is like. Um, I will also say as well that when it comes to on-campus interviews that everyone is definitely on their best behavior and is showcasing their offices or their departments or their universities to the best of their abilities. But that's also something to note is that there is no perfect office department or university out there, but there could be better fits for you. And so it's just being aware, not being afraid to ask those specific questions. And like I mentioned, mentioned earlier, you know, your willingness to maybe potentially attend an on-campus event, um, to potentially, you know, walk around the community to see if there's, you know, posters from the university or that community so support, not being afraid to ask random students or individuals they see of why they attend that university and what keeps them there. Um, because the more information that you can get, especially in a non-interview structure, the better idea you'll get of exactly the climate of that institution. Um, will the questions listed in your presentation in regards to self-reflection and job quality be emailed out or were um, uh, yes. just um, go ahead Anna. Oh, my apologies. Um yes it will. And then just to let you all know, um those are just a couple um, I am, I feel like a resource, like <laughs> a queen status. Um, I like to keep everything and I have a lot of resources from self-reflections to potential interview questions on different worksheets and um, values inventory. So if you all would like access to any of that, we can make sure you get that um, to you all or you can also email me as well and I can make sure to provide you with that information. I'm all about sharing resources. 
how do you answer the question of it seems that you're, you do, you have jumped around quite a bit. Can you explain that? Yeah, um, I think when it mentions that of like, you know, moving from position to position, um, and even if you were to look at my resume in the last like three years, different positions. So for some employers, they may say like, hey, this person is, has moved quite a bit. I think when it comes to that is really knowing like, you know, from your perspective, like why did you move? from place to, you know, from place to place and not being afraid to showcase it, but in a way where you're also being, you know, respectful, but being aware of who you are. Um, for me on my end, I know one of my go-to responses is, you know, it's a fact that an, another opportunity came, you know, came my way unexpectedly and I pursued it. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with showing that, you know, confidence and justifying those reasons. But at the same time, if you do come across an institution that is very hesitant or looks down upon that, then is it really a good fit for you? Um, and, you know, to see if you're getting asked more questions about, well, why did you move? Why is your timeline? Why were you there a long time? Rather than them focusing on your skill sets and what you can offer and bring. So that's just some uh, way that I would potentially try to navigate that. I think sometimes it's important uh, because it is sometimes as an employer, you're looking if you're part of a search committee, um, it could be red flags about why this is that you're moving around. Um, but you have your reasonings of why. I think that being transparent with the search hiring manager is key. Of why was the reason of you moving? You know, are you not relocating because you got incentive to a doctoral program? You know, you have family. Uh, family issues happen. My family is asking for my support. Being transparent, I think, it will be key versus um, employers making the assumptions that you're relocating just because you're just moving around from city to city or so. And that's also interview. My apologies, Jenny. <laughs> um, but also okay. I wanted to highlight too that let's say if you are moving around around because it is not a good fit or you're very unhappy, then that can also be a key indicator that you're not researching or asking the right questions that you need to in order to find the best fit for you. And if you need help with that, you're more than welcome to contact me. <laughs> mm -hmm. How important, according to you, are informational interviews and one's job in the file of higher education? That's a question. Um, hmm. Do you have um, any suggestions, Jenny, as I process? <laughs> um, how important, according to you, are informational interviews and one's job search in the file of higher education? Mm -hmm. I would definitely will have to get back to you. Um, or I, or I was also uh, thinking just now, thanks everyone for your patience, because I am naturally a processor. <laughs> um, I would say when it comes to like informational interviews or opportunities that you're able to get to know a department or office, I would highly, you know, encourage that, you know, for your attendance, um, because that just gives you another opportunity to get to know the individuals that are facilitating that. But I will mention too, when you do use the language like informational interviews, that might be different depending on the department. So for example, when someone hears informational interviews, it might just be an informational session that they're highlighting their um, positions and just for attendees to come to get to know. But then also too, for that language for informational interview, sometimes it's even doing a group interview right then and there. Um, so I think, you know, it's important to note that for the informational interview, that you're aware of what does the informational interview mean to that employer on their end so that you're prepared if you're attending and kind of what to expect. Thank you, Anna. Uh, next question. Um, do you have any suggestions for doing a joint search uh, where both partners are in student affairs? Yes, that's an excellent question, and I say this because currently my partner and I, we are both in higher education student affairs. We both work in housing, and we've actually worked at the, our last three previous institutions together. <laughs> so that is definitely a topic in itself, and I would welcome the opportunity if you are in that 
process where you are doing a dual search and you're even focused in the same category, like my partner and I were both in higher education, student affairs, primarily in housing, I would welcome more of that conversation. But something that I think is very important is that when trying to do that dual search is being very open with your significant other or partners and knowing what are the factors and things that you need and what is it that they need and trying your best to support one another. But like I mentioned, that's a discussion entirely in itself. And I would welcome to have more of that in personal conversations just with my experience that I've had previously. Due to time, I do want to thank you all for all your questions. And if you do, let me go. If you do have any questions related to this topic, feel free to reach out to Anna Lucia. That will be more than happy to be able to set an appointment with you or answer any of the questions virtually. If you have any questions specifically related to the placement exchange, uh, feel free to email the candidates at theplacementexchange.org and we'll be able to answer that, those questions. Our next webinar uh, that will be co uh, coming up is Navigating the Placement Exchange as a Person of Color, and that will be a panelist of professionals. That will be on November 30th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. We also are offering a candidate Q&A question uh, to be able to answer any questions that you might have if it's on-site to CPE or just navigating the job search. And one of the new initiatives that the candidate team is implementing this year is uh, Facebook Live. So we'll be doing one on what exactly is professionalism happening on, on December 13th. On 5 2018, it is in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, um, February 28th to March. is open now. The early birth ends on January 5th, so please visit our website for more information. And last but not least, uh, if you're interested to become a CPA volunteer, or you do know your supervisor, your professional volunteers. So um, thank you so much, everyone, for participating. And I do want to thank Anna for, for facilitating this discussion regarding um, how to find the find how to stop searching. Thank you so much. Everyone have a wonderful, um, wonderful day. Take care.